Hi, I'm Larry McDonald with the Bear Traps Report. I'm really happy to bring George Whitehead to the table today because what's happening over the last seven days in markets is something historic. And it's something we're going to look back even decades from now and talk about this this month and or the last month of, of activity in markets. Uh, central bankers around the world have been promising us lots of accommodation withdrawal, lots of balance sheet reduction, lots of rate hikes. And they've done some, but they are breaking markets. And the financial conditions tightness globally uh, is really bringing a lot of uh, cockroaches to the surface. A lot of uh, unintended consequences are developing. And the epicenter of some of these uh, rude awakenings uh, came out of the United Kingdom last week. Uh, George Whitehead, uh, I've known for almost 20 years, and uh, I think on the street, he's one of the top, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the top sell-side gilts traders in, in the world. Uh, he's, they, they, he's known on the street as the godfather of gilts, and gilts are UK government bonds, and uh, he eats, breathes, and sleeps gilts. Uh, all the big accounts globally, all the big buy side funds I have, have a tremendous amount of respect for George. Uh, he's an advisor to some of the biggest hedge funds in the world and asset managers and pension funds in this space. If you want to trade guilt or know anything about it, George Whitehead is your man. George, um, the reason I think this is so important is over the last week, just to recap for everybody, the Bank of England did a a, a substantial reverse pivot. They were pounding their chests four weeks ago about Q, QT, quantitative tightening, uh, balance sheet reduction, you know, killing inflation. Now we have 10% inflation in the United Kingdom, and they're essentially turning QB, QE back on. And then we look at the RBA in Australia, same thing, promising lots of accommodation withdrawal, pretty big reversal there. Then we look at Paul Krugman and all these academics that are coming out, including the IMF and the World Bank, uh, coming out and turning on the Fed. And essentially the Fed uh, and the strong dollar and a number of other factors are really blowing up the global economy, blowing up financial markets behind the scenes. Under the surface is a tremendous amount, you know, much more stress. Bring us back to last week, George, when you saw the early signs of this coming in. I know in our Bloomberg chat with the institutional investors, you were talking about this maybe 15 days ago uh, in terms of uh, what was happening in the gilts markets and with the pension funds and, and that disconnect. Bring us back to, to what you saw. Yeah, I mean, backdrop was basically into the FOMC meeting and into the Bank of England MPC meeting. The market was getting used to the idea that there will be the start of the gilt sales. The gilt UK sales, so, you, so UK bond sales. Yes, UK bond sales um, from, from their QE portfolio. They've already started drawing those down this year. And up until the meeting last week, the market really expected a 75 basis point hike and gilt sales to go ahead. I expected 50 basis points and gilt sales to go ahead. So, And they delivered the 50 with a three-way split vote, one for 25, five for 75, and it's a, sorry, five for 50 and uh, two, for, two, two for 75. The build-up from there was the day after we had the MPC meeting, we had the physical. That's um, the that's the, the Monetary government. Policy Committee of, of the UK. Yes, the Bank Monetary of England. Policy Committee on the twenty second, and then we had on the twenty third, uh, early in the morning, we had the UK fiscal package, where the market had been expecting around one hundred billion extra gilts for the next financial year. So the, the market was expecting a hundred billion of extra gilt sales for the coming year. Yes, between okay. between that day and the end of March twenty three. So when they announced roughly 62 billion extra gilts, um, the market took a dive um, until they really looked at the shape of the funding. The shape of the funding was rather than where trust had been indicating the UK Prime Minister that they were looking at extending the term of the debt of the UK market, the Debt Management Office had persuaded the Treasury and the Prime Minister that it was better to issue a lot more shorter debt than burden the country with 50-year debt at a time that it was stretching the realms of reality to fund that, that far out. So they reduced yeah, the, the longer duration debt has higher coupons. It's easy to cheat and fund a government in the front end of the curve with lower coupons. Is that the point? It, it's how the UK has got away with not having downgrades over the last 20 years on the back of extending, having the longest debt in the world and being able to finance long term. But for these kind of measures, when it may be a two year, five year problem, they shouldn't be funding 50 year.
And explain and some say, of the, the drops in the long duration paper. We're talking about some of these. The problem is they did so much QE um, in 2020 and 21, 22, or, I'm sorry, 2020, 21, that a lot of the coupons are 50 basis points, 75 basis points, 100. So think about a coupon on a, a billion dollar bond that's got a 75 or 50 basis point coupon. And then the long, the long dated bonds in the, in the markets are yielding 5%. Uh, so we're talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 point drops over this year in some of these, some of these pieces of paper. Yes, and, and if you look at the real yield bonds, the UK 2068 dropped from, in the last year, have dropped from around 265 big figure to the, the low last week of 49 big figure. So, they had so 265 to 49. Positive real yield. Now, what was happening with the pension fund? So, so bring us through like... Uh, you know what I think to, to set this table, right? So when central banks are overly accommodated for for very long, long periods of time, they don't allow business cycles to function over long periods of time. That's what's been happening the last, you know, since Brexit or even before since Lehman. So central banks don't allow price discovery. They don't allow business cycles to function with tremendous amounts of QE. And so what happens, you know, bring us through the insurance companies. What were they doing behind the scenes to juice returns and some of those derivative contracts that are tied to gilts? Uh, what was the what was the real pension blow up behind the scenes? If you like, going back thirty years, when the, when historically pension funds used to have ninety five percent equities, five percent five percent bonds, they switched then with regulation where they wanted pension funds to have safer assets to protect pensioners. So the, the average pension fund has less than fifty percent in stocks now, and the rest in fixed income or cash. And what, what happened 20 years ago, the pension regulator allowed a bit more freedom for uh, and, and with, when liability-driven investment was created, LDI. Li so well, yeah, walk us through liability-driven investment. That, that's yeah. key. And with liability-driven investment, they were allowing leverage or to give a return over and above safe assets where there's obviously risk being taken. And what's happened when you get a, a risk situation where everybody tries to exit at the same time with swap spreads widening. They, a lot of the weaker funds with weaker credit ratings had to raise capital. Well, they couldn't suddenly raise one, two, three, five billion at the drop of a hat because nobody was willing to lend it to them. So they were forced sellers of high quality assets to fund their margins. And so, so in other words, just to keep it simple, if you have a 1% coupon and you lever that portfolio 10 to 1 on leverage, all of a sudden you, a 1% return becomes 10% return, right? Now, not that they were doing that extreme, but what, you know, what, what types of transactions were going on behind the scenes? And then what, uh, what, what caused the margin, you know, the margin calls? Obviously. Margin calls was because what happened was that they, they were taking a safe pension fund out of safe assets, totally hedged with Asset, and polit asset liability match where the maturity and return matched, they would then take, they would give a, a higher return for, say, 10% of a pension fund portfolio. If rates are 2%, they would offer, say, 2.5%. They would then sell the safe assets, uh, receive on the swap, so they were getting a return. So sell the safe assets, sell, sell the, the gilts, the government bonds. Yes. And then receive and then, on, then the, on the swap. And holding the swap, and the swap would be collateralized against cash. Uh, so so you... as suddenly the, the, the market shifted dramatically with long yields, the, the day the Bank of England intervened, basically, long yields rose from from an overnight level of around just over 4% to just over, to just under 520. At, at that point, uh, obviously, the, the Bank of England had realized to keep the financial system in place. They had to step in as buyer of last resort because no bank has the ability now to um, provide that amount of capital in a short period of time because of the regulatory controls on them. So the, so, so the F, FPC, Financial Policy Committee, met. they created the, the Financial Stability Intervention Tool. And rather than hiking interest rates, which would have created even more carnage for the currency, they didn't use reserves. They created reserves. At the time, they announced 60 billion unlimited purchases for long the gilts over 20 years maturity, which stopped the market in its tracks, reversed and yields fell 100 basis points. So you suddenly had a buyer of last resort in the gilt market for the people that were, the, that were forced sellers. 
not for everybody. And as the bank has since tidied up the operation, there's now participation codes where you have to prove who you are to be eligible for the program. And they reject the, they reserve the right to reject any offers they consider are just speculative on the market. Oh, interesting. So they've put through qualifiers as to those uh, who yeah, they transact the with. Managing offers have had these for a long time for auctions and syndications. The Bank of England have been more trusting. Sadly, the trust has been, looks as though it's been abused probably through the APF program as well. Where and the, a- the APF, just to make it clear for the audience. Sorry, the asset purchase facility. Yeah, the asset which purchase Which was the QE program when they were buying gilts. When they, yeah, they so when as, they were doing QE during COVID, uh, it was yes, too liberalized and people speculators came in and tried to play trade against that yeah and and i think they ended up in a situation where they weren't that they didn't know who the real end seller was so participation codes now we we as asteroids have an a participation code so we can participate in the operation but if anyone participates with us they we still have to declare their code so it's the whole process is transparent yes and you're at aster ridge which is a you know, I, I think one of the premier boutique, you know, boutique uh, fixed income shops, especially on the, in the guilt side. I, I, I like to think I've added something to them since 2016 when I joined and, and introduced them much more to the debt management office and to the Bank of England. So, yes, I, I think we have debt, debt, debt fin experience and in this kind of inver- environment, trying to get things simple and avoid a lot of the banana skin. The bank had gone through that process since 92 when we pulled out the ARM. And that was in, when obviously the, the government used to control the interest rates and the bank wasn't independent. From that period, they were moving towards independence. And that's when uh, they, they brought in the MPC. They set up then the PRA and FPC. And the FPC is the one that stopped in this time around. Yeah, so that's one of the most. So for people watching us that trade equities or bonds or uh, currencies, what's what's really driving this is, the, I think, the fundamental development is central banks are are not independent and the, the political the debt leverage in the planet earth is 50 trillion 5 trillion more debt on planet earth today than there was during the last hiking cycle 2015 to 2018 and we know back then the fed funds rate got up to uh, two and a half for 250 basis points and now we're at 325 basis points and so as, politi- as politics moves in, as you can see in the United States, it's becoming very political. You've got Elizabeth Warren coming at the Fed. Like I said, you've got Paul Krugman coming at the Fed. And then you have all of these. I was in Washington last week, and we met with you know different people on the Hill. And the, the talk is from the Treasury Department, people that we met with over the last 10 days, You know the amount of calls that the Treasury and Fed are getting from finance ministers, from all types of financial institutions around the world, uh, it's just, it's at Lehman levels, like that type of incoming inquiry in terms of, okay, you're trying to fight inflation, but you're also going to break something. You're also causing massive political stress because at the end of the day, as the Fed lowers inflation in the United States, they're actually increasing inflation because so much trade is in dollars. If you buy oil in dollars, if you buy soybeans in dollars, the dollar is really strong and you're an emerging market country. Uh, the strong dollar is literally blowing up things around the world. And this this, politi- this politicization of central banks it, is a big, big issue because essentially the politics behind the scenes uh, and some of the stresses there is essentially reversing central bank policy. Is that correct, George? You have one, one of the interesting points with the Bank of England. The, when we had the leadership challenge and Liz Truss eventually won to be PM, she initially was saying she was going to change the Bank of England remit. She was going to review the independence. Since she's actually taken over, she's backed off. And she's realised that the Bank of Independence is central to policy now. So as there is a situation where the Bank of England in the past would have raised interest rates, used up all their reserves, run on the currency, and we'd be in a mess. This time around, they use financial stability intervention, as we discussed. It's a tool which I think is being looked at by most central banks and most uh, institutions around the world now as an alternative in an environment like this where the Fed is causing the issue with keeping interest rates, accelerating the rate of hikes too quickly when the currency is already massively overvalued for the rest of the world. 
there was an article this morning, I think, showing that um, global reserves have dropped four trillion in the last month. Global reserves. So those your central banks and treasury departments of, around the yeah. world, other governments, global yeah. reserves have dropped four trillion. So they're already feeling the pain of having to support by either liquidating assets or provide assets to other um, uh, institutions. And, and walk us through what you heard uh, in recent days around the Swiss National Bank. The Swiss, I think, there's lots of developments there, as we were discussing, with a 78%, 78 billion drop in site deposits, which is around 20, 25% of their entire reserve portfolio, shows that there's been probably more withdrawals from the likes of Credit Suisse to be moved elsewhere because they're concerned about the health of Credit Suisse as a Swiss bank and similar situations with Deutsche Bank. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so there's a there's a flight to quality and and we saw this with Lehman. What happens is when, as credit default swap the cost of default protection rises, then people pull their money out of the, these banks, even though uh, the banks aren't, you know, aren't on life support or anything like that. There is a credit issue. Um, credit Suisse clearly has a, a, a you know, a, a, a questionable balance sheet, right? You came in 2008 when you had Northern Rock, a run on Northern Rock. The government had to nationalize Northern Rock. Then it had to nationalize NatWest. They had to buy 50% of Lloyds Bank. And all of that was from the initial situation where you had a building society who had entered derivatives market and uh, clearing banks were the same. In, in 2008, clearing banks had zero amount of guilt holdings for their reserves. They were actually short of around 60 billion, which is why in December 08, the, the debt management office for the treasury issued 60 billion guilds, which were sold straight into the banking system which propped up the banking system again. Otherwise, they would have been turning off the cash machines in the UK. Now, now, walk us through. We hear a lot about the US twin deficits, but if you look at the UK as just a, pretend it wasn't the UK, pretend it was just yeah. an emerging market country. Walk us through the fiscal uh, pressures that are coming on to monetary pressures. I, I think the combination of the, the um, if you like, manufacturing versus service sector in the UK has always been the issue for the last 20 years. We, we, we've moved to be in a much more service sector economy rather than manufacturing. The new government wants to um, invest in manufacturing and um, we've always had the flexibility by being, uh, being, sorry, having our own currency to revalue or devalue. And I think this has been a classic situation where we have the opportunity outside of the EU uh, where sterling has found a level yeah, again, 103.50 is where it got to 25, 30 years ago. And and that's where all the support came in for the actual currency. So money flowed back into the com country. It, it's it's dependent on other factors as well. You know, so, the, the... so when you, as, just to make it really clear, um, so you were talking about the last 30, 30 years of the manufacturing economy became a service economy. So therefore your uh, your deficit in terms of, outflows of capital to the rest of the world because you're buying things from around this from around the planet uh but now as the currency has depreciated uh some capital is, is coming back yes and, and and i think um as, as long as we can get through the current period the the stability of the bank of england and the consistency of the government allowing them to be independent that that balance now you have a chance from the governor to speak every day even going back to when Boris Johnson was prime minister, they, uh, the Rishi Sunak really spoke to the Bank of England only more than once a month, maybe once a fortnight. So I think communication is all better. And I think they, they're, they're learning from the mistakes of not talking to one another and not being as open as they can be when, when there's a crisis building. Now, George, one of the things I talked about in, in my book, so I wrote the New York Times bestseller. It's now published in 12 languages about Lehman Brothers. And um, it's a CFA Institute top 20 all time. So it's in the top 20 business books ever written. I'm really proud of it. And uh, as a former Lehman trader, I tell my wife once a month, if we sell a million books, 
we'll break even on our Lehman stock, right? <laughs> but um, one of the amazing things that, that I want the, the viewers to understand, and this relates from, from this, listen, Credit Suisse is not a Lehman Brothers, but there's some similarities there. And there's also some things that are very different. When the financial crisis happened in 2008, your core capital were your government bonds and the banks, and that was actually strong. So your risk capital, your risk-weighted assets were in horrible condition, you know, subprime mortgages and the like. But your core capital of these banks in the United States and Europe was relatively strong because interest rates were falling, bond prices were rising. That was keeping a lot of the banks out of trouble. Lehman wasn't so lucky. Uh, today, if you're a bank like Credit Suisse or any bank in Europe, your core capital, uh, you're talking about gilts that have dropped 20, 30, 40 points. And you've got the CET ratio. You've got these financial ratios that you know banks have to fund themselves. But if your core capital is in trouble, and then if you're heading to recession, your risk-weighted assets are in trouble, then it sets up a, a much tougher dynamic. It's, it's in some ways worse than the financial crisis because you have a balance sheet that's under pressure on your safe assets and then pressure because as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So your safe assets, your core capital is in, in some trouble. And then your risk capital is in trouble. But so, so if you think of Credit Suisse, it just looks to me like because of this dynamic and only 1%, I mean, they, they literally have only 1% and non-performing loans right now as you're heading into recession. You got to think that that rises. But I just think that, and George, what's, I don't know if you don't have a public take, but the probability of some type of backstop, it's not going to be Lehman. Remember, Lehman wasn't backstop. That's why it created you know, the worst financial crisis since the Depression. But the, the, the banking system in Europe is so weak that it just forces the Swiss government to come in and, and sometimes somehow backstop uh, and, and it'll help bring in investors by, by backstopping the transaction. I mean, what happened in the UK in 2008 when, when, when the system was on the edge? Um, the lessons were learned from then and that they reverted back a lot to what used to be in place with reserve asset ratio to own X amount of safe assets versus your market cap. And I, I, there was a Treasury report a couple of years ago that they've actually reflated the whole banking system and the UK banking system safe assets now are around, last figure I think was around six trillion. So the UK repaired the UK system by putting sureties in place that they have to have lots of safe capital where if they suddenly had to liquidate a lot of anything that they can do it and, they, and they're not, there won't be a run on them. Um, they're now well protected. Yes. And, and so if you're Credit Suisse, um, like you said, the regulators around the world have forced these banks to to hold more treasuries in the US, hold more gilts in, in the UK. The problem is these safe assets are dropping um, you know, 10, 20 points a week or a month. Uh, mm -hmm. So that puts Credit Suisse, who's been through Archegos, Greensill, LBOs are blowing up with Citrix. And so the pressure on Credit Suisse, they need a big investor. Um, they, they need a government backstop. And so what are you seeing, George, over there in terms of liquidity, in terms of in terms of how the Credit Suisse situation has been impacting markets directly? Yeah, well, I think the markets are functioning well. I think people are aware of what's going on. I think people are more disappointed at the lack of um, acknowledgement from the ECB that there are issues out there. And on, on the day that the Bank of England raised rates last, there was actually a report out about financial stability within the euro sector that they're concerned about. Yet they're still talking interest rates need to normalise closer to a 2% level which at a time when there's question marks over some of the banks in the system, they're adding pressure by continually being overly hawkish. And they're ignored. Part of the reason for, for them being overly hawkish is I think they're trying to talk the currency better. But when you've got a record high dollar, it's having zero impact. Yes. And once again, the Fed, uh, because of they're so much more hawkish than all the central banks in the world, it makes it very difficult for the other central banks because dollar strength, euro weakness, weakness, pound weakness, and it just adds to further stresses. So for you know viewers watching us right now, the probability that this game is about to end is very high because 
at the end of the day, right now, the Fed funds rate at 325. I've been saying, I've been telling clients for over six, nine months, I didn't think they'd get it above three to 325. The street expectation is for four to 5% Fed funds. That exponentially breaks things, okay? That exponentially would, would, would cause several Lehman type events, I think, if you got up there. And so, I think the on there, and, and interesting enough, the UK last week hit uh, the, the forward rates for, for, I think, 18 months, hit interest rates in the UK at around six and a quarter percent. Now, six and a quarter percent, the mortgagees in the UK will be handing keys back. They won't have to because this time around, foreclosures, as long as you pay some of the mortgages, houses won't be taken back. The rules have changed a lot. But it, it is a classic. The forwards in the UK are still suggesting that the Bank of England may have to take rates to six percent. I'm not in that camp, but I think uh, UK-wise, if we see rates at 4%, I'll be surprised. And the other point people are missing is that if the bank pursues guilt sales, we've already done 40 billion of drawdown of the quantitative easing portfolio, which is equivalent to around 50 basis points on rates. So that to, over and above the two and quarter percent we're at, they're already really at two, two, two and three quarters. They're proposing 80 billion of sales over the next year, uh, 80 billion of sales would be the equivalent of 75 basis points on rates. So there's no way the Bank of England need to raise rates as high as the forwards are suggesting because the job will be done with the withdrawal of liquidity in the system. Yeah, and that's the problem is inflation is all the inflation, inflation data is, is going to it, it, um, come down, but it's a lagging. So here's the fundamental well, problem. This is why it's such important for a real vision audience, right? Your inflation yeah. data is going to come down, but it's going to come down very slowly. But your financial conditions tightness is going from normal, you know, say normal financial conditions issues are like moving at 10 miles an hour. Now you're moving at 150 miles an hour. So it's really a battle between in terms of Fed policy or central bank policy over the next three months. It's really, OK, inflation versus financial conditions and inflation's moving very slowly at five miles like a turtle. And uh Financial conditions are the rabbit with, um, you know, dual engines. And so what's going to happen is with an extremely high probability, and Ralph Paul and I have talked about this, is you're, you're going to have the financial conditions break the central bank sometime in September. I'm sorry, sometime in October, November. And that causes um, not a 2018 pivot. But when you're promising one trillion of QT and you're promising another 150 basis points of rate hikes on top of the 325 you just did in six months, any walk back there weakens the dollar, uh, gives the pound some support, gives the euro some support and stabilizes the global economy. That'll bring money. You know, that'll help hard assets. So not just your precious metals, but any kind of uh, commodities and any type of emerging market equities and value stocks. Because at the end of the day, this whole dynamic is going to, which, which, which goes right back to the Bank, Bank, England, Bank of England and you, George, this financial conditions trumping inflation is going to create a dynamic where we live, we're going to be forced because of financial conditions, we're going to be forced to live with, you know, four, five, six, seven percent inflation for the next three to five years, maybe longer. And that's a whole new portfolio construction relative to the previous decade where we had. You're a absolutely spot on, Larry. And I, and I think on, on that point, the one thing um, from the UK perspective is we, we're a country that's been used to having inflation and that hyperinflation. We tend to strip most things out of our inflation data and we still have a positive number. And I think the mistake the central banks made when they were doing QE, one, I think they did QE too long. Uh, and two, I think you got to a situation where um, the impact of the QE was disguising the build up in disposable income where people had a lot more cash at that point. So they were willing to pay high prices, which is why the central banks with their transitory view for a year, they were basically doing the ostrich trick with their heads in the sand while inflation was just accelerating everywhere. And they woke up too late to realize that there was a big inflation problem. Yes, everybody woke up too late. Transitory, yeah. transitory, transitory. Yeah. But, you, but, but, but it is a classic now, the level of yields for real money at the long end of the UK market. Everyone's worrying about the panic of when the Bank of England stops the support operation, supposedly on the 14th. The level of yields we've got now with the dynamic shape of new issuance being shorter, real money will turn up to buy the long end of the market, which is their natural home. 
international investors will buy the short end of the market because sterling is attractive and there's a, a, an enormous amount of redemptions over the next year where that cash will be invest, reinvested in the UK with sterling anywhere close to these kind of levels. What are the implications there? Um, implications, I think money then may get taken away from other markets, but it, it, the, the biggest sea change will obviously be if there's any change in the war in Ukraine. Ukraine we haven't talked about, and I think it's a situation nobody has a quick fix for. Mr. Martin, he does, but you know, he's on his own planet. Um, but uh, I, I think you will see any kind of change in the tone of that will put the Fed under more pressure to take their foot off the pedal because people will change, will reduce dollar assets once they feel there's any kind of glint of light. And the, and the last thing on the Fed, if they keep the Fed funds rate here one year from now, you're going to have about a $400 billion swing. So in other words, your interest on reserves, the Fed has to pay interest on reserve to the banks. That's going to be yeah. about $200 billion higher. And then your interest on the debt. On just the net, on just the debt of the United States, it's going to be four hundred. So it's about a net net four hundred billion dollar swing, where that creates all kinds of political issues with the Fed dealing with you know what's called the Humphrey Hawkins testimony on Capitol Hill next summer. That's going to be very entertaining. George Whitehead, great to have you with us. Uh, I want to let you get back to. I think you got some, a lunch with some institutional clients uh, later. Well, I guess a dinner now. Um, but thanks so much, George, and uh, thanks for joining us on Real Vision. Pleasure, Larry. Thank you very much. Okay, all the best. Thank you. Bye. It was really great having George Whitehead join us today. I thought it was a very compelling take. My takeaways are, listen, the Bank of England, that pivot is such a colossal statement to the global economy, global central bankers, that they probably overcooked the goose this time. The inflation fight, financial stability is try, starting to overpower inflation. And that is such an important factor in markets right now. It's probably the most important because if the Fed gets stopped by financial stability, it has a major, potentially massively positive impact on asset prices. And uh, I also thought, you know, learning more about how things work in the, in the, in the UK guilds markets and, and how the, all those side effects from uh, through the banking system around the world from U.S. U.S. versus the U.K. financial stability and the inner workings of that of the of the bond market in in the U.K. and, and George is a value to us. He's a, one of the most respected people I know over the years on on the sell side and on the buy side. So thanks, I really appreciate uh, you joining us. Hey there, revolutionaries! To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to RealVision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.